All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. We're just going to get started in just a second. Uh, we'll give everyone a chance to get all the lines connected, and uh, and we'll just get start. We'll get the uh, presenters introduced and on our way. Looks like everybody's coming in. We've got quite a large audience today. We had about 160 people registered, so that's excellent to see the interest in, the, in, this, uh, in this topic. Um, my name's Doug Maynard. I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Episode 2 of our, uh, I guess it's an, an extension of our webinar series on FASD. Um, and this one uh, we, we've called Beyond, Beyond Screening is what we're talking about because CAFC's initial work in, F in FASD has been about developing screening tools for FASD. And we, over the last few years, we've done a series of webinars uh, on, our, on the screening tools that we've collected and compiled into a toolkit. Um, and during those webinars, we inevitably had questions about screening, obviously, as that was the topic of the webinars. But we always had questions about uh, service delivery models, about interventions, about diagnostics, about FASD in general. And although not the uh, the focus of the webinars, we did try to answer some of those questions. But there was just such interest in those areas outside of screening that we decided uh, with uh, CAFC's uh, rehab network, our Canadian network of child and youth rehab, which is the, the subset of CAFC's membership that are focused on rehab services. We decided to uh, partner together with some of our other colleagues in the FASD world, such as NeuroDevNet, and bring this this FASD series. So we're really pleased to bring some of our colleagues, uh, the researchers from the NeuroDevNet community. Uh, we have Dr. Gail Andrew, who is our uh, co-chair of our KT and Research Committee within CINSER, and lots of our other CAFC colleagues to to extend this this webinar series in FASD, and uh, and bring this 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 extended content. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, uh, show you a, a couple of things. Uh, we this is as I said, this is episode two of the uh, webinar series. Episode one was uh, was um, was called uh, "Beyond Screening: Understanding the Core Defi Deficits and Diagnosis of FASD." Um, so I uh, I just wanted to show that the, it, all of these webinars are recorded and posted up on the CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network, which you can see up on the screen now, uh, with the full audio visual recording. Um, that being said, this uh, webinar is. Uh, scheduled for an hour we almost always especially with these large audiences have the questions go beyond the hour i think our presenters are, are able to stay and, and answer the questions. so if you do have to leave go, by all means go ahead and leave but just remember that the it is all being recorded and you can always go back to the knowledge exchange network at uh, ken.cafc.org that's ken.cafc.org and you can just search for fasd or the, the the content is all tagged according to fasd or webinar and you can find it there and you can always go back and, and watch the end of the webinar if you do end up having to miss the webinar. Um, so uh, without any, oh, actually, I'll just uh, also mention, we, since we do have a large audience, we won't be able to unmute people in order to ask questions. Uh, so we will have to uh, require people to type questions in. And, and I want to encourage people to type the questions in as they're being, as you think of them. Don't feel you have to wait until we call for questions. Just type them in as you think of them so you don't forget. And when we get to a natural break in the presentation or if at the end of the presentation, we'll start uh, introducing these questions to our panelists and... Uh, and, and get them uh, discussing all of the all of the questions that are going to come from the audience. Um, and before we get started, I'd also like to uh, I'd also like to um, see how many people are out in the audience. We we know that lots of you watch in groups, and uh, but we only see one line or one sort of one line for each each group that's registered. So we don't know how many people are out there. We know there's often groups of 10 or 20 or 30 watching. So just to give us an idea, a, a sense of the audience, just go to that question box that I was mentioning and just type in the, uh, the the number of people that are watching with you, whether you're watching alone or if you're watching with one or two people in your office or if you're, you're uh, in a conference room with more. All right, so we've got everybody answering the question, so. Lots of small groups of two and three. All right, that's great. All right, all right. So let's just get started with the uh, with the content. We do have, uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Gail Andrew, who's a, the co-chair of our KT and Research Committee at uh, within our Sensor Group, with us, and she's going to be helping facilitate uh, this session. 
Um, not only is she helping to facilitate, she is uh, uh, an expert in, in FASD and is a pediatrician at the Glen Rose Rehab Hospital in, in Edmonton and has an extensive background in a number of uh, provincial and national in initiatives all related to uh, FASD. So uh, without any further ado, I'll just hand the uh, virtual podium over to uh, Dr. Gail Andrew to uh, introduce our speakers. Over to you, Gail. Thanks, Doug. You know, it's been my great privilege to see the real expansion of knowledge, interest, and research in FASD across Canada and um, internationally, of course, but Canada really is starting to take a lead in many different areas. And I think uh, one of the reasons for this is uh, we do have the Canada FESC Research Network. It initially started as Canada Northwest FESC Research Network, but now has expanded beyond just the western and northern province, provinces and territories to the whole of Canada. Um, and also the other partner in FASD research has been through NeuroDevNet, which is also a national organization that has looked at three disability groups cerebral palsy, autism, and fetal spectrum disorder as their, their focus. So we've had lots of opportunities to uh, expand what we know. In our first um, presentation um, done by myself, Dr. Carmen Resmus, and, and uh, Dr. James Reynolds from NeuroDevNet, we did talk about understanding the core deficits and what research is informed about the diagnoses. But one of the things that we stress about diagnoses, it's really your starting point and diagnosis really must lead to interventions or support systems that can make a difference for the individual affected by prenatal exposure to alcohol and also their caregivers. Um, it's a complex system of care that needs a lot of navigation and uh, developing better uh, pathways of access. In order to do the interventions, we need it to be informed by the information of strengths and deficits from the diagnosis. But really the interventions uh, need to be both targeted as well as broad and across the, the lifespan of the individual. And if we do have good interventions, the eventual outcome we hope is that we will prevent secondary disabilities or what we often refer to as adverse outcomes for these individuals. These adverse outcomes are most often within the mental health arena or end up with very costly uh, secondary problems within the justice system, homelessness, and the ultimate is repeating the cycle of having re second generation, third generation of children born prenatally exposed to alcohol. In order to look at, evalu uh, at interventions, of course, there has to be good evaluations. And that's where we're really lucky to have the um, research team of uh, Dr. Jackie Pye and Dr. Carmen Rasmussen. So I'll briefly introduce um, Jackie Pye is assistant professor in the Department of Educational Psychology and clinical assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Alberta. Uh, she is a registered psychologist and has been in practice. Um, Dr. Pye's background is interesting. She had a career as a criminologist and a forensic counselor be before, and worked with incarcerated youth before be developing her other interests. And this is really motivated her early work and her current interest in, again, prevention of incarceration and that ultimate adverse outcome. So she has become um, quite focused on interventions in FASD, uh, along with her uh, research and both clinical work. She is also the lead of the Intervention Network Action Team, INAT, for the Canada FASD Research Network. And Dr. Pyle will explain a little bit more about the network's activities. Dr. Carmen Rasmussen, okay. assistant professor, section of pediatric neurosciences, Department of Pediatrics, University of Alberta, and um, co-appointment here at the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital. She has extensive background in research on neurobehavioral function in children with FASD. She's also a core member of the NeuroDevNet FASD team, and she holds many other research grants that focus on, on neurobehavioral aspects of FASD and neuroimaging studies. And uh, Carmen and Jackie have collaborated uh, in the work on interventions. So I'll turn it over to the presentation team, and I think Jackie is going to start. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Gail. And uh, good morning to everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. 
Uh, so Carmen and I are going to talk a little bit today about what's working with FASD and give you a little bit of an overview of um, some of the intervention approaches and strategies that are showing some really positive evidence of uh, effectiveness. Um, we're going to do this and, and before we sort of jump right into interventions, as Gail uh, already indicated, um, I wanted to first just start by introducing again that Canada Research Network and in particular the Intervention Network Action Team, which is a team that both uh, Carmen and I are members and work with. And the goals of this team and the relevance of the team to the presentation is working to support innovative research uh, and practice as it relates to intervention, creating communication opportunities so that we can share um, research results that are coming out so that we can develop collaborative research teams so we can start blending our initiatives and our activities effectively both within and outside the FASD world and also looking at high quality research and um, research that really impacts the community um, that we work within. And so it's this perspective that both Carmen and I bring to the research and this um, uh, vehicle that we often use to help to communicate and share and invite others to partner with us and work with us and share what they're doing within the intervention research world. So much of intervention research is happening in the community right now and so finding opportunities to blend what we're doing in the universities or in the labs as to what's happening in the community so that we can uh, come up with some high caliber um, good efficacy information to continue to direct our practice most effectively is a real core goal that we share. Um, let's see if I can progress my slides here. Oh, there we go. Um, this just shows again uh, another image of how we believe the innovation quality communication components are very interrelated and that ultimately it's through opportunities like this where we can talk to people about what's going on and invite conversation and questions and ongoing communication opportunities that we think that the intervention practices with FASD are going to continue to advance so that we can provide the best services to children and families and individuals affected by FASD. So in terms of our presentation today specifically, we're going to start by talking a little bit about FASD and as uh, Dr. Andrew Gale just finished talking about, um, to some degree, interventions are really directed by understanding areas of strength and difficulty in the FASD population. And some of those efforts then are very targeted in terms of saying how can we uh, ameliorate or how can we remedy some of these fundamental difficulties that an individual might have so that they may then function themselves more successfully. And so we're going to provide a snapshot of some of these targeted intervention approaches that um, have been trialed and are showing some uh, exciting evidence of success. Then we're also going to talk a little bit about intervention approaches that take a bit more of a process approach. Because when you work with the FASD population, improving the capacity of the individual is important, but often not sufficient for supporting them fully in their life. And so we look at how at a systems level can we also be providing effective support that makes a difference both for that individual as well as the caregivers and individuals uh, within the systems that these people will be working within. And so we're going to give again a snapshot of some of those system level interventions that have been implemented and also are showing some um, nice indication of uh, success. And we're then going to speak a little bit very briefly about how we can continue to integrate our work into both both types of interventions through communication and collaboration because clearly both targeted and system level interventions don't operate in isolation and how we marry these approaches and become collaborative and integrated in the way that we think about providing support to the FASD population really boils down to how effectively we're communicating and collaborating with other researchers, with service providers, with people in the community, with clinicians, practitioners, policy makers, and so on and so forth. And we'll finally wrap up with some key conclusions as it relates to FASD intervention. So we're going to begin with interventions responding to areas of strength and difficulty in FASD. Um, Dr. Andrew again remarked on some of the core deficits. We are not going to go through all the core deficits, although there are intervention 
uh, studies that have been done that address many of these uh, areas of brain injury that are identified within the FASD uh, population. However, today we're going to focus on three in particular, um, a math intervention, a self-regulatory intervention, and an executive function intervention. So I will take over um, from Jackie now. This is Carmen Rasmussen speaking. Um, so the first study I'm going to talk about is a math intervention that was developed for children with FASD. Um, we know based on previous research that math is a significant area of impairment in, in children with FASD and, um, and even more so impaired than other academic areas. So there is something specific going on with math and FASD. Okay. Um, so, in 2007, uh, doctors Julie Cable and Clara Coles from Atlanta, um, they actually developed a math intervention program for young children with FASD, and they tested it. Um, it's called the Math Interactive Learning Experience, or MILE, I'll refer to it as MILE throughout the, the presentation. So what they did is they assigned young children with FASD, it's designed for very young children, actually aged 3 to 10 years of age, and, and you might be thinking, well, how much math is a 3-year-old doing? But I mean, there's number concepts and understanding differences and more and less and things like that at, at even that age. So, And so what they did is they assigned them to the math intervention group, the MAL group, or a standard psychoeducation group where that group just received um, some educational planning and help with their, their general education program, but they didn't receive the one-on-one -on -one intervention. The math intervention was six weeks of individualized math tutoring, usually in sessions at about one hour once a week. And so um, the children came into to their research lab for this, these sessions of math tutoring. There also was a parental component for both groups where both groups, um, the parents of children in both groups received um, education on FASD and strategies for dealing with children with FASD and parents in the math group, they received extra instruction and, and support on how to support math development in children. So in general, the MAL program, um, um, a big component is that it attempts to remediate the underlying cognitive factors that are related to math difficulty. So things like a general slower learning ability. So they have a slower pace of instruction, active learning. Um, they have a lot of attempts to assist with working memory difficulties that are related to math. So using cues, repetition, small pieces of information, and also the visual spatial skills that um, difficulties in those skills that could lead to difficulties in math. So um, guiding visual attention, adding structure to paper, using a vertical number line. And then um, they also assisted with their visual motor and grapho motor skills, was, which is actually helping the children in writing the numbers and placement and whatnot. And then in metacognition, so helping the children identify what they were doing to, to do this, the problems and what strategies they were using. So this is really the one-on-one -on -one tutoring, and, and it, it, is, it is uniquely, um, each tutoring session is, is unique in that it is designed to the um, to the areas of need for each child. So the results were very positive. They found that children in the math group showed more improvements over the course of the six-week intervention than those in the control group. And um, parents of children in both groups reported improvements in behavior. So remember, um, parents of children in both groups received extra instruction on, on, or extra assistance with dealing with FASD. And so they actually found improvements in behavior in both. And then when they looked at the children six months later, the, the mild group still had higher math scores than the control group, which is really important, um, showing that they still are doing better in math, and both groups um, still actually had their improvements in behavior. So this is a, a very um, positive study showing that this type of intervention can improve math skills in children with FASD. We're actually taking the study and replicating and extending it. We, um, myself, uh, Drs. Andrew and, and Dr. Pai, are collaborating with um, Drs. Cole and Cable from Atlanta who developed the, the MAL program to replicate and extend it here in Edmonton, Alberta. So we received funding from ACCFCR and we're conducting this research with the Glen Rose Hospital and local school boards. We're replicating the study in that we're using their um, math program but we also are extending it in that we um, have made a number of changes. So um, first of all, our comparison group, we decided not to have a comparison group that doesn't, that receives no intervention. We wanted to offer something to the comparison group as well. So in our study, the comparison group is receiving a social skills intervention because we felt that social skills would have very, very little overlap with math development and we still wanted to offer something to that group. And social skills is also an area of impairment in this population. 
we have different pre and post measures. Um, we're, we're, we're testing a wider variety of math skills and other cognitive areas to see whether or not they improve as a result of the intervention. And we're usually conducting it in the school system rather than in a laboratory setting because it, it, um, we, we felt that would be easier for the children and families not having to bring their child into the lab all of the time. We reduce the parental components mainly because we want to test the effects of only the tutoring and the math component without the extra parent training to see if that is effective. And then um, we just have a slightly older sample, age five to 10. And of course our sample here is diff different demographics. So we haven't published any results yet, but some of the pilot data that we have complete on 12 children, um, eight in the mild program and four in the social skills control or contrast group, we found that um, children in the mild pro program are increasing um, um, by, by more points on, on a math test than children in the social skills intervention. So we're seeing, we are seeing more improvements in math in, in the children in the mild group. We haven't looked at any of the other outcome variables and we'll be looking at that shortly. Um, when we look more, more specifically, five of the eight children in the math group in improved by half a standard deviation or more on their standard score. So that's actually a pretty big improvement to make over um, a six week uh, period. In, in, in math. So we were pretty impressed with those results. So that's where it is now. Um, we um, hopefully will have more results obviously by the summer to report on the full sample, but um, we definitely are seeing some positive results. Next, I'm gonna talk about a self-regulation intervention um, that has been tested with children with FASD. So Wells et al tested a modified alert program in children with FASD. So the alert program um, is published by Williams and Schellenberger, and it focuses on emotional self-regulation and sensory integration training. Anybody can go and find information on the alert program. You can just Google it. It's a very common program. It's not developed for kids with FASD. It's developed for children with difficulties with self-regulation. So it's used in a number of different populations, and there is quite a bit of research on it. And they have a website and lots of different training programs. Um, it's really focused on being able to regulate yourself, regulate your emotions, be in tune with your body and, and be able to calm down. And a lot of people um, call it, how does your engine run? Because it, they use it, the analogy of an of a engine throughout the program. So what Wells et al did is they um, had 78 children and they were either assigned to the alert program where they had group sessions on the alert training over 12 weeks. And I think it was about one session a week for 12 weeks. And then they had a control group who did not receive any intervention. And they did find that the alert program, the children in, in the alert group did improve on parental reports of measures of, of executive function, which is parental reports, but they also had a specific test of emotional control that they did with the children, and they did improve on that as well. So there's some really good preliminary evidence that this um, alert program is effective in improving executive functioning and emotional control. There has been one other study that has been done in Canada on this. I don't think it's published yet, but they also did find some positive results. So I think there's some really interesting things um, with this alert program. Um, when we look at other targeted intervention studies, um, I'm not going to talk about each of these, and this list is not exhaustive. Of course, there are other interventions in FASD, but these are some of the key ones that are out there that have shown some positive results. There have been some positive results of a language and literacy intervention program that was done in South Africa. Also um, with a colleague of ours, Kim Kearns, um, a positive result of her attention training program. In the US, they've, seen, they've done some social skills intervention programs that have been effective and also some behavior and school functioning interventions. And then also interventions um, focused on personal safety, also conducted by Claire Coles, who developed the math program. So right there, I think I'm gonna hand it over to Jackie because she's gonna go into some of the other interventions that um, a couple of other targeted interventions and some of the more process specific ones. So I'm going to speak um, about uh, executive functioning intervention and this builds off of the one the attention process that uh, Carmen was just referring to uh, that uh, Dr. Uh, Kim Kearns has done some initial research on and that we have worked with her in partnership to further develop. Um, and really what we're looking at, this is research in remediating um, cognitive functioning and is developed out of traumatic brain injury research, looking at how do we improve deficits in aspects of attention and working memory. And in this population or in this situation specifically applied to FASD. So what we're doing is using computer-based materials that are specifically geared towards attentional and inhibitory training in conjunction with metacognitive and behavioral interventions. And I'll explain both of those components of this intervention. First of all, 
we're working from the um, idea that there's experience-dependent neuroplasticity, meaning the brain can learn new behavior in response to rehabilitation when we're repeating activities, when they're doing something over and over and over again, when you have enough time so that repetition occurs over an extended period of time. There's sufficient intensity in that repetition and duration, and that it's very salient, meaning that you've got a really specific um, target that you're working on, and that requires a, uh, a high degree of engagement and um, reward to maintain that attention and focus on those salient components for these children. For these reasons, gaming became a fairly nice opportunity because we can, it's one place where we can really reproduce these conditions with children in, in a way that isn't necessarily as tedious. So to get them to invest a lot of time repeating activities with a high level of intensity and focus on specific details is essentially what kids do when they're video gaming. And so we thought, well, you know what, let's use what's already working and other researchers have done the same thing, but we're honing these games and we're also complementing them with metacognitive strategies. And in these two conditions, we are definitely seeing some changes and there is good evidence towards um, um, improved and different uh, uh, neuroplasticity as a result. Now, um, the name of the game we originally used was Cognitive Carnival. That game has since evolved and we're now using one called Caribbean Quest. I have some pictures to show you at the end here. And what we're using are, as I said, in application of metacognitive skills, helping the kids to monitor what's going on while they're playing the game. We help them to self-regulate, being in the process of controlling their thoughts and actions. And we help them to scaffold their activities. So the game itself is scaffolded, meaning it starts out easier, it gets more and more difficult. And the coach that sits there with them while they're playing the game, so they're never playing independently without a coach or an interventionist with them, is also helping to do that. Children are encouraged to employ additional strategies and to think about their performance. So why do you think that didn't work? What else might you be able to do? And that interventionist is employing these uh, uh, activities with that child while they're working through the game. The child's encouraged to be an active participant in this process, so they help to brainstorm. It's not that the interventionist is providing them with strategies, but rather the child is engaged in that process as well. We speak to the students and the kids that we're working with and say, you know, the brain is a muscle that grows stronger with exercise. A bit of an oversimplification, but really works for the kids. And it's something that they can really access and, and, and is sort of exciting to them to think, ooh, I'm making my brain stronger. Some of the metacognitive skills that we use when we're talking about metacognitive, again, that's awareness of how they're performing. So not only do we want them to be doing the, the massed performance of repeating an activity um, uh, with sufficient intensity and salience, but we want to make sure that they're developing the skills that are going to help them to continue to do this outside the video game. We also want to help them to be playing this game in a way that their practice improves. I often compare it to uh, if I'm learning a athletic sport, say I'm going out and learning tennis, if I pick up a tennis racket and just start swinging it around, I could do that with lots of repetition and intensity uh, and time, but if I'm not swinging my arm properly, the stroke I develop may not be an effective stroke. So having a coach there to help me adapt that strategy and, um, and best hone that skill is going to help me to perform that task optimally and ultimately in terms of brain and neuroplasticity and the way my brain is wiring, I will optimally wire up according to that coaching in conjunction with um, that repeated practice that the game provides. So really we're talking about a combination of two factors here that together produce these optimal conditions. So some of the metacognitive skills are things like clarifying directions. So slowing the kids down, what does it really mean? If you hear alphabetical order, what does that mean? Uh, encouraging the kids to pause, let's put down the controller for a minute, let's read the instructions, things that these kids often will move beyond. Um, giving them strategies around memory. So for instance, one of the tasks will show them a soccer ball, a baseball, and a volleyball on the screen. Those three things then disappear and they have a little submarine or they have a little Mario figure depending on which game they're playing and they have to move around a uh, gaming field and track down these 
objects in the correct order without picking up any of the interference objects. So it's a memory task. It's a focus task. And, and so getting the kids first to make sure that they actually read the list is really important to inhibit that behavior. And then how do they remember it? And some of the strategies of remembering, remembering material like shortening span has been quite useful for them. And we found that these kids are really able to employ these strategies, particularly when they're practicing them over and over and over again in these gaming formats. We also uh, speak to some of the physical uh, components of metacognitive strat uh, strategies. How do you deep breathe and then relax? So for instance, how do you know you're starting to get too tense, too stressed, and you're no longer able to perform at your best? Um, we create, we look at physical strategies in terms of how they complete the tasks, how they might draw on a screen, um, how they might use their fingers um, as sort of manipulatives, what they can do um, to make physical associations with information. So we're looking through all of these different options and we train these with the kids and they practice them over and over and over again every time they're playing these games. Information regarding the strategy use. So in looking at how these kids are using strategies, the results of some of our, our research has found that we see increased use of spontaneous metacognitive strategies. So what we've been doing through this is not only are we measuring and, and um, conducting neuropsychological assessment tasks, both pre and post intervention, but we're also tracking their use of strategies for that metacognitive component. And what we find is that Towards the end of the intervention, they are using way more uh, spontaneous metacognitive strategies than they were before. We've also um, had some uh, lovely feedback in terms of qualitative information we're also collecting uh, around observed changes within the schools. These interventions are all delivered within the school system. Uh, in, in the, the children's schools. And so we have had um, lots of qualitative feedback around the significant behavioral improvement in the students and the interventions. We work with many schools, so you'll see that this particular quote, I've noticed significant behavioral improvement in all three students in the intervention. That would be three students in that particular school. The actual intervention itself, we typically, we've run it now for two years. I'm looking at Carmen as I'm saying that. Um, and the last year we had 24 kids enrolled. The year before that, I believe we had 16. And this year we have another group that we're working on. So our numbers are gradually growing in, in that regard. So three students is, is within one school. Uh, in terms of some of the neuropsychological assessment results, one of the areas that we're seeing the greatest improvement is, is aspects of attention in auditory and visual spatial modalities. So in both their ability to attend to information for a longer period of time that they're hearing or seeing is one of the most significant improvements that we're seeing uh, as a result of this. And that has been echoed by um, the qualitative data we've been collecting. Um, as of yet, all of this data is still being compiled and we have yet to publish any of it, although we're hoping to complete some of it in uh, the next couple of months for some of the earlier data. So we hope to have some of that compiled and finished analyzing it uh, for publication uh, shortly. Um, what we are doing right now in, in uh, the intervention is we have actually created a training uh, modular to go with it. And this year, starting actually in the next week, um, we will be training uh, educational assistants through a number of schools, both in Alberta and British Columbia. Dr. Kim Kearns is in, in BC and Victoria, and so she's got some sites there, and we have some sites here. And we are training educational assistants to be the ones administering this. So we're moving into more of a um, applied use of this tool and saying, can we now train the schools to be implementing this and do we see the same levels of efficacy and effectiveness as we did within our more controlled research assistant delivered uh, approaches. So that's the next step for this and we hope to have that completed within the next 18 months, uh, at which time we're then hoping we can gradually roll it out to be more accessible to schools and, and other individuals with these training tools supporting it. And these are just a couple of pictures of the game so you can get an idea of what sort of things they're looking at. Um, the top left one is the submarine where they're chasing down certain objects that they have to remember. Uh, in the bottom, they have to, the bottom right, they're having to click on a fish of a particular color. Um, and so as they go through the windows.
So again, it's about response inhibition, attention, remembering certain materials. Those are the tasks that they're asked to do. So that's a few of the targeted uh, interventions that Carmen and I have just covered that are attempting to remediate specific areas of difficulty for individuals with an FASD. And in particular, we're speaking to children at this point in time, children and youth. But there's also a process approach to intervention, meaning how do we work with the systems of support? Details may help us refine our approaches and evaluate our strategies for intervention, but they may not equip us for the variability of demands. They may not allow us to be as flexible as we need to be, particularly when we're talking about the systems. So it's one thing for us to talk about going into school and providing a math intervention or an executive function intervention, attention training intervention, all of these targeted things. It's another thing to think about how do we work with the school themselves, the teachers, for day-to-day -day responding? What kind of supports we put in place? How do we work with caregivers or other systems of support in a meaningful way? What kinds of programs and approaches are demonstrating the greatest effectiveness in uh, a system level of supporting optimal functioning in individuals with an FASD? So, a couple of things, or I'll talk about three programs today. And, and all, in all of these programs, what is attempting to happen is moving a little bit more from scripted or more targeted interventions towards how we improvise, improvise and how we respond in fluid and more spontaneous ways based on our broad understanding of FASD and what's going on in terms of brain and behavior interactions. So three programs I want to talk about today are uh, the Wellness, Resilience, and Partnership Program, which is uh, a program uh, with Alberta Learning here in Alberta, uh, an ARC training model, which is also an education, but also been applied within some clinical settings. So it's a training model. Um, the data I'll present today, or the information I'll present today, relates to uh, education settings, but the model itself is also being utilized and, and studied with other groups. And the Family Moving Forward Program, which was developed by uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Heather Carmichael Olson in Seattle. I think I actually put those in the wrong order because I think I'm going to start with the family moving forward. Yeah, so I'm starting with families moving forward. Now, the Families Moving Forward is a positive parenting intervention program designed specifically, so this is a program that has been designed for children with an FASD, but not even as a general population. It's designed specifically for those children who are presenting with significant externalizing behaviors, so acting out behaviors. These are the families who are really um, struggling. Um, these children often have low adaptive functioning and very high behavior problems. So even within the FASD population, these are the children that are presenting most severely in terms of behavior and whose parents are experiencing high levels of stress and difficulty as a result. The program is de delivered individually to families by clinicians based on some specialized training that they have been provided. They have ongoing access to supervision and consultation. The program runs for about nine months, give or take. So it's a very um, lengthy program as they go. Um, and the uh, contact with that interventionist can vary depending on who's implementing it. Um, every couple of weeks is typically the way it's been used, although different uh, groups have implemented it differently. Uh, there are manualized session outlines for the intervention. So there is actually some structure in terms of the content that's provided to support parents and strategies and approaches and ways that they could work with children with an FASD. However, the intervention is also flexible enough to respond to the needs of a diverse population. So recognizing that families and children are all very different, this allows for a very fluid and adaptive response. So they're teaching um, families some really very positive parenting tried and true strategies. These are not strategies that are unique to the FASD population. These are strategies that would be effective with any population, with children with behavioral concerns or, well, arguably positive parenting can be applied to all children with, with uh, really effective outcomes. So in this group, um, the, the approach has been applied and it's been applied to this very specific population. They've been using it or the, FA, the, the model has been used um, for children 4 to 12 years old in its current manualized format. However, there is some ongoing research to extend that into adolescence but the manuals as they exist right now and the supports that are in place with the program right now as it stands are for these younger years. 
This uh, program has been tested a few times. I'm just going to speak to one uh, a study, a randomized control trial that was done in Washington State in which two families raising children with FASD and behavior problems were randomized into one group receiving the FMF services and another receiving the community standard of care. So whatever was already available to them as the control group. Findings show that the FMF group reported significantly greater family needs met. met um, uh, studies of parent F or measures of parenting efficacy pre and post intervention demonstrated a much higher sense of parenting efficacy within the FMF group. More parental self care, meaning parents were doing a better job of taking care of themselves and feeling better able to respond to the needs of their children, and a decrease in the child disruptive behavior. So, measures of disruptive behavior both before and after the intervention revealed that actual disruptive behavior had declined. So not only were there perceptions of positive impact, but there was actually evidence in um, behavior change. Um, since that particular study, there's also been community-based trials um, and early findings again. And so community-based trials, meaning that moving it into broader community settings, looking to extend the findings from that controlled study into broader community um, settings indicate treatment is feasible there as well with 86% compliance, high satisfaction and treatment acceptability. They're continuing to do this work and they'll have more information around behavior change and um, long-term results from this approach that is still forthcoming. The Wellness Resilience and Partnership Program Project is an educational project that um, sits within uh, the province of Alberta this is the uh, efforts of this program are to provide an innovative and collaborative approach to strengthen youth and their families in the community, working from the school center as the hub. They say to do this, we need to address some of the barriers to development and learning in children and when in this program, pardon me, is adolescence. So it's largely through junior high and senior high, which in Alberta um, is about 12 to 19 years old, with a little bit of flexibility there. And they do this by um, placing success coaches within schools. Some success coaches will be within a few different schools to engage in discussion, provide knowledge and resource and strategies to support students with FASD. So essentially these individuals will sit in schools to provide that expertise uh, within the school, they provide some one-on-one -on -one support to the individuals with an FASD. They also provide support to educators, uh, the teachers, the administrative staff in terms of generating solutions and alternatives. They do a lot of advocacy, so they also will work outside the school with those students to help uh, coordinate perhaps services that are outside. So particularly within high school, as we're looking at transition to adulthood, the success coaches are often advocator, advocates and mediators with those outside organizations to help support next steps for youth as they are moving forward. The project is to provide, as we look at the, the circles here, supports to junior and senior uh, high school students with FASD, provide um, about two days a week support to each school, um, for a school to participate or receive a success coach, they need to have a minimum of five students with confirmed or suspected FASD diagnoses within their school. So that's the requirement um, for a school to say we'd like to have a success coach for two days a week. Currently, there are nine coaches in 21 schools in 13 school districts in Alberta. Um, there is a strong community of practice now that has been developed and is continuing to evolve for the success coaches in which all of them are working uh, jointly as well to try to support one another and generate alternative solutions. So not only is the success coach working with the individual schools, but the success coaches are working with one another to continue to support success and look for new ways of providing supports and services for students. The idea being, if we're looking with adolescents, and particularly older adolescents, and we can provide better services and supports for them at these crucial periods of time, particularly as they transition into adulthood, we may reduce some of these adverse outcomes that Dr. Andrew was referring to at the very beginning of the introduction. 
if we can alter their school environment or alter the way that we're providing supports to them and, and find a improved goodness of fit within those systems, we may maintain them in the school system. We may have greater success seeing them complete their time in the school system as opposed to leaving. Um, traditionally, in, within Alberta in particular, we see a very, very high rate of dropout and expulsion for our children with an F or with our adolescents with an FASD, which leaves them then very vulnerable to those adverse outcomes and engagement in things like criminal behavior and substance abuse. For those students who are involved in um, the RAP program, uh, uh, approximately 70 of them have had an FASD diagnosis. Uh, four of an assessment pending, four suspected, and there are nine unknown that they simply um, have been put forward as uh, possible. Now, some of the um, rates that we're looking at in terms of indications of success within this program has been simply monitoring the students who have been involved. The program has been running now since 2010. So we have some statistics for the first two years currently, and then of course we're collecting for this year, and each year we're adding in a few new things. But just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of some of the um, positive indicators of success of this program is that we've seen for 72 and then 80% of the students involved in the program, no suspensions recorded for the entire year for those two years, either 2011-12 or 2010-11. Those are really, really positive rates for kids who, um, prior to enrollment in the program, were typically experiencing at least one suspension um, a, a year, if not more. Um, only 13% in each year had one suspension, and 15 and then 8 had two or more suspensions. This is a significant change over previous years for these students and um, a nice success rate. Course completion, looking at are these kids actually staying in class long enough to complete courses so that they may rec receive credits um, that will support graduation. 84 and 87 percent are actually completing courses by project year. Again, significant improvement. These are kids who typically will leave courses and drop out of school midway through and often because of the high rates of things like suspensions, they're not completing their courses. This is a significant change. Uh, for these kids over our typical uh, rates of uh, uh, course uh, dropout. Um, again, course completion during the project, students new and students participating in. So the first bar, 79%, are the students who are completing um, courses uh, through 2011-2012. So this would be all of the 79% is students who entered the program in 2011 in the September and 79% of them completed. What's really exciting is kids, students who entered our project in 2010, so the previous year, and had longer time to build relationships and become engaged in the project, 97% of those have been, had completed their courses in 2011 and 12. What this is telling us is that um, students' uh, enrollment and involvement in the program uh, shows increased adherence to course completion and, and successful outcomes as they maintain. So if we can have them for all three years they might be in high school, we're going to see uh, increased um, success rates over time, which is really exciting for the project. So that's the RAP project, just sort of in a glimpse and, and uh, definitely some indication of success there. Now the ARC training is um, just an approach that says we need to look at process when we're working. And this is the process, uh, the training program that I indicated has been done with educators, um, which includes teachers, administrators, educational assistants in the province. Um, but also recently has been adapted and is being used with clinicians, um, service providers in the community, and a number of other professionals because it's more of an approach and a strategy than it is anything uh, more firmly set. It looks at the fact that uh, we need to look at how we're better connecting our knowledge and our application of that knowledge. Um, for instance, in working with uh, educators, we often found that they were able to articulate the need of a student for instance, a student with an FASD may struggle with 
um, language-based understandings. And yet when asked, okay, so then how do you respond to this child when they're misbehaving? The response is, well, I take them in aside and I explain to them what they did wrong and what they need to do differently. So even though they can articulate an understanding that visual strategy or verbal strategies are not effective, they're not necessarily implementing interventions that reflect that knowledge. They're simply returning to those things that in the heat of the moment are how they are trained to respond. And so our question became, how do we help to um, enable and prepare individuals to use alternative strategies? What does it mean not just to change our knowledge, but to change our behavior? And that's the, the ARC model of practice, which is a very simple model, um, but something that does require you know, some intentionality uh, was, was introduced and we've been using it. In this model, we talk about action, reflection, and communication as being the three core components of learning and adapting our behavior. We need to be able to communicate, and communicate involves learning, sharing, um, uh, and accumulating knowledge. That knowledge could be coming through a webinar, that knowledge could be coming through an exchange with, with another professional. We need to be taking action based on that knowledge, meaning I need to be willing to try new things, and, and try to implement what I'm learning in these communication opportunities. And then I need to be reflecting on that practice in order to identify in what way I've achieved goals, what goals was I trying to achieve, how is this working, how isn't it working, and then return back to communication and action to adapt and modify the approaches I'm using. This is not rocket science and it's certainly not an all new approach to doing things. But when we look at the way in which professional development is often done these days, it's usually one shot, we provide information and then we leave and people are left to apply that and think about action and reflection and communication on their own without any kind of support in uh, that sort of essentially practicing those, those processes and engaging in them collaboratively. So what we did is we actually implemented this approach within two school districts. One was an urban, one was a rural school district. The urban was actually a single school. We worked with a single high school and a number of individuals within the high school. And in the rural, we worked with an actual school district. And so we worked with a large group of people. In both cases, we provided at least three sessions. And in those sessions, the first generally was to provide information about FASD in the brain. We introduced the model of how we want to do training, but we also talked a lot about FASD in the brain and how the brain is impacted and what that means just to give them that knowledge base. They then leave those sessions, they go home, they, they um, have some homework sheets wherein they're asked to track some of their interactions with students with an FASD in terms of what happened, how did you respond, why did you respond that way, and what could you have done differently. Very basic behavioral strategies here. We then bring them back for another sec session, at which time we talk about um, reflecting on what worked, what didn't work, and what did that mean. We found that that next session was really quite powerful for them because they were often able to say, well, you know what, I tried this and it totally didn't work. And I thought, wow, maybe it's because of this. And, and suddenly they were able to generate their own solutions based on their own knowledge, their own expertise. But given the time to reflect and practice and think about these and come back and communicate them, they were better able to implement and shape their own behavior. And the last session was similarly going away, practicing more things and bringing it back for collaborative discussion. Um, in each case, both groups generated tools and resources that they also felt would be useful in helping them to implement and work within their settings. So really it was creating a process that allowed them to be acting, communicating, and reflecting on their own practice, having time in between to generate or try these, these approaches, and then coming back and working with this. Again, not an entirely new approach to doing things, but by implementing this style of professional development, we were able to see some significant changes in the way in which practice took place in these schools. We collected data through our meeting notes, session recordings, surveys, and we had a number of tools that were generated that we looked at. Some of the key themes that emerged and, and some of the comments that came out of these approaches with a, there was an improved understanding of FASD, moving away from um, the ideas of blame towards understanding what actually the brain was doing and what was going on. We saw much uh, an increased focus on strategies that support success 
for students with an FASD. So not just reactive and what is wrong or how do I solve problems, but rather how do I create success was one of the biggest shifts in perspective um, that took place. Um, this is just an example of one of the tip sheets that was generated by the high school that we worked with and that they created, this was based on and adapted from um, other work that has already been done in terms of this idea of brain not blame, wherein they took it and said, this is the way it makes sense for us. So you can take a look at that. Um, they also talked about in, improved a collaboration and stronger professional relationships by engaging in this reflective process and having the freedom to say, this worked and guess what, this really didn't work. They were um, able to release it as terms of it wasn't just their own personal success or failure, but rather they were part of a team who were trying new things because that's what was required for this population. And they were willing to kind of take some more risks and discuss their respective areas of success and difficulty. There was increased sense of advocacy. So they really felt as though they could look out for the needs of individuals because they were better equipped for that and had better understanding. Lots of nice communication between other teachers and individuals within either their school or their district as they all became sort of the advocates and the speakers for these individuals with an FASD. We also found a real change and improvement, uh, improvement or increase in reflective practice where action and communication really became incorporated in what they were doing. Um, where they were able to look at different perspectives and look at their own behavior or their own uh, interactions with students and think about how that might be affecting the outcomes that they're seeing. So finally, I'm just going to kind of do a quick little wrap up by talking about how we integrate our work through communication and collaboration. And really all I want to mention is that with so much emerging knowledge about function, and all of these things that Carmen and I have talked to about today uh, in terms of intervention, it becomes really overwhelming to say, well, how do I know what to do? What do I look for? Um, where is all this information kept? Carmen and I sort of provided you really a nutshell overview uh, today and tried to give you a lot of information really quickly, but how do I deal with this in a more um, continuous way? Well, through the Intervention uh, Network Action Team in the Canada Research Network, we have three um, tools that we're trying to use to help create um, those opportunities for information exchange. We have a newsletter, a blog, and a website that I invite you to take a look at and feel free to participate in. So our new e-news is just an effort to um, provide people with sort of updated information and we email that out on a quarterly basis. We have a blog where we post um, probably every other week or so just with uh, upcoming information, new research studies that have come out, uh, little tidbits here and there that try to keep people linked. We also have a website that uh, provides information about functional issues that you might see with an individual with an FASD across the lifespan. So from zero all the way up and, and when you move into the wiki, and you feel free to explore this website, it's nofsd.ca, you'll see that there's more information about what those deficits are and particular strategies and resources that might be available to address those, those issues. In conclusion, what we know, the scientific evidence is still emerging, but there is evidence that change can happen. We are seeing um, success in those targeted interventions. Individuals with an FASD can make change and can grow. Can grow. So reasonable expectations are not the same as no expectations. We can see change. That said, we need an integrated system of support and information sharing that allows us to also provide the level of environmental support that will be equally necessary. Those targeted interventions will help with some growth of the individual, but that will not be sufficient. We also need that integrated system of support that allows them to fully maximize their potential and us see the greatest success. From this point on, we encourage you to contact us about ongoing research, to add to information on the website, and to think about ways in which, if you work with this population, you are attempting to connect and communicate with those individuals. We really think that um, a good portion of intervention practice is going to be how we communicate and how we share information, not simply within the FASD population. There's tremendous learning and opportunity across all sorts of children, as you've heard from both Carmen and I, a number of these approaches that we're talking about 
are not unique to FASD. We're simply looking at the fact that they are also successful with FASD. Often what works with children with disability works with many different children with disability. And so looking at how we can create partnerships and, and shared understanding across um, groups and disciplines is important. And our contact information for you here, feel free to contact us for any further information. And I think at this point, I turn it back to Doug. Excellent. All right, thanks. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Jackie. Uh, great presentation and lots of great resources. And we'll, uh, we'll try and get as much of that up onto the uh, uh, Knowledge Exchange Network as we can, any of those links and maybe your contact information and that sort of thing. We did have a couple of questions related to access to slides and and all of that. Uh, as I mentioned at the top of the webinar, this webinar is recorded, so you can see the entire uh, the entire presentation again as, as many times as you want, really, um, <laughs> on the Knowledge Exchange Network. And uh, and hopefully we can get the slides as well. We can make a PDF of those and make those available so they can have access to all of those references that are on the last two slides and some of the other uh, ac uh, websites and that sort of thing that you mentioned from the uh, Canada FASD Network. Um, so we do Dr. have a number. Gail, can I have a bit of a devil's advocate comment first? You absolutely can, yeah. Well, we've been talking about um, a lot of personnel, time, training coaches, training teachers, training caregivers and parents. We're, we've talked about uh, you know, the research that's showing this is successful. Uh, it's costly. But I wanted to remind everybody perhaps uh, from our first webinar, when you look at the lifetime cost per person with FASD in Canada, it's been estimated one individual will cost an extra $1.8 million. And that doesn't include their loss of productivity, the impact and stress on caregivers. I don't think we cannot afford to put in place these interventions that are showing such promising uh, successes. And on a kind of just qualitative uh, note, I'm I have conversations often with caregivers and, and especially my teenage patients. And if they've received this type of support, they're much more confident. Uh, they're much more, I think, personally successful. They feel that they're fitting in more. And that we can't measure that type of information in our research studies, but having the conversations with these people, it really helps. The other intervention that was not mentioned perhaps we will not need if we have more universal applications to some of these other interventions, and that's medication. Um, we often see children coming in for their initial diagnostic assessment on four or five psychotropic medications that don't necessarily work on a damaged brain. The drug receptors are, are altered, so the efficacy of drugs is much less in this population. With good support, often medications may not be needed. And the cost of medications, when you look at that alone to the health system, is significant. So again, my comment is I don't think we cannot afford to put in these interventions. All right. Thanks, Gail. Uh, and we are right at 12 o'clock. Uh, we do have a, a number of questions. And, and as I mentioned, I'm sure many of you may have to leave. And by all means, go ahead and, and, and check out the recording afterwards to, if, you want, if you're interested in hearing the, the, the discussion that's going to follow here. Um, so we'll get right into the questions. The first question that came in was during Carmen's portion. She was talking about the MILE program, and Barb was just asking uh, if the MILE program is available now for schools or families to purchase or access. Um, not really on an individual level. Um, we are hoping to, right now, we are not recruiting any more individuals, but we are hoping to. We're waiting to find out about another grant that um, we'll find out about in April to continue the study. But I don't think that it's um, available yet for purchase by individuals, but I could look into that if somebody wanted to email me. But um, we are hoping to um, start a lot more recruitment um, in the spring if we get additional funding. All right, thanks. Um, the, the next question I think was uh, during, just after it changed from Carmen to, um, to Jackie, uh, she's asking what a what age are the computer interventions delivered? I'm not sure which specific ones, but you, you were talking at the beginning of your section, uh, Jackie, about some computer based interventions. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, we have been using them with I think our youngest has been six and our oldest has been 14. 
So we've covered a fair range. Um, I would say it's ideal within the elementary school age at this point in time. Um, that said, there are other kind of approaches to computer intervention that we didn't talk about today that are also geared towards some of the older um, kids as well. So while all of these approaches are all still being researched, so um, they're limited in terms of accessibility right now, unfortunately, but um, the good news is there is a variety of them being looked at and, and, and the goals of all of those individuals involved are to um, rapidly get them to a place where they can be um, accessible by public or organization. Um, Kristen also uh, is, has commented, she said, these interventions seem to offer hope. Uh, she said, how do you, she goes on to say, how do you balance that message of hope with the reality that we cannot cure FASD? Uh, you talked about exercising the brain to make the muscle stronger, but as you said, that is an oversimplification. Yeah. Well, I, I think that um, it depends on what we're, our hope is for, I suppose. I, I think that um, when we're talking about hope, I, I hope these, I hope <laughs> these interventions uh, do provide us with hope. And, and when, um, as Dr. Andrew said at the beginning, and we've talked about before, um, we see a lot of adverse outcomes with these individuals and what we really want to see are better outcomes and, and we really believe that there is still, um, having a disability doesn't mean that you do not have potential and that you cannot experience success in life. How we define that success or what it looks like might be different when you have a disability, but it doesn't mean it's not success. And so really looking at how we define success and, and being hopeful for the potential of these individuals to experience success as opposed to some of those adverse outcomes, I think is really what um, we feel strongly about. I'd much rather see an individual transition from high school and perhaps they need a supported employment type placement because of some of the disability that they have, but then the fact that they might be able to go to work and maintain a job and live a life and and feel productive, that's great success and I feel great hope for that as opposed to dropping out of school and, and engaging in drug use and, and incarcerate and, you know, becoming incarcerated. The more that we can find um, these, these more positive outcomes and, and ways to get there, and, and it's very challenging and it's a very challenging population. So uh, we have hope, but we're also uh, completely cognizant of the fact that, that this is a challenge and, and that this is very, very complex. But I do like that use of the word hope because I think that's something that um, we wouldn't work in this area if we didn't believe in the potential of individuals with an FASD and want to see people experience hope and not just discouragement. And that sort of ties into the, the next question, which is actually from a family member. And I do know we have a number of parents and foster parents, et cetera, caregivers of, of children with FASD. And, and Michelle has, has sort of commented that she wished she'd better understood that this webinar was for academics and therapists, and, I, and I, I get the sense that it perhaps was a little bit further into the research than she was uh, was interested in. Um, but uh, but I think that's part of the message for for any of the parents out there is that, is that there is hope. It's not about just throwing your hands up and doing nothing. Once you receive a diagnosis of FASD, there there are things that you can do. And I I hope this webinar has given those family members out there at least some information or inform the questions that they might bring to their their caregivers about what options might be available to them. But uh, do you have any comments yeah. about that? She's saying that she was hoping it would provide it, that this webinar would uh, would give examples of interventions that families are using for improved success with their FASD child. I mean, any comment about that for the family members out there? Well, I, I think that one of uh, if they want to take a look at some of those resources that I named at the end, because you're right. I mean, we largely were presenting on some of the evidence, and and so it does make it a little bit more of that researchy end of things. But one of the things that's really important to us with the research network is to connect with and communicate with families and caregivers. So our goal is not simply to be talking research. And that's why we've looked at things like this blog site and the No FASD website, both of which we're really trying to gear towards use by everybody, including and especially caregivers and, and those folks who, who are working with the individuals with an FASD on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, you know, even if the research was kind of like, I don't, I'm not as interested, I'm hoping that they can take a look at some of those resources and, and um, find some of those uh, strategies uh, and, and uh, some of that information a little bit more that they were hoping for. And if not, they're certainly welcome to email us and, and um, 
if we can continue to help direct them towards other places that we are trying to create communication and those networks because it's often not about a recipe book. We don't have a whole lot of do this and, and, and these are what's working. Um, and so a lot of times it's about creating those conduits, those places where people can communicate and, and sort of engage in that trial and error, work together and support each other through that. Uh, Doug, if I may comment as Gail speaking, um, we do have a system of care developed through the province of Alberta that perhaps we could even use this for another webinar, but the whole province is divided up into sections and they're called FASD network programs. And there's a coordinator in each one of those network sites whose responsibility is to develop partnerships locally within their community to provide the services for caregivers and individuals with FASD. And one of the services uh, in the Edmonton area, we call it coaching families. So it's a go-to service where families can get for their information uh, about FASD, behavior problems of their particular child. Um, they can, there's in-home consultation. So there's that type of level of support. Uh, other services involve a mentor for the youth themselves with FASD to help them navigate the system. And system navigation is really important, especially in that transition from adolescence into adulthood. What do I do next? Where do I go to? So this whole system of care is in the process of, of being developed province-wide. And actually, Carmen, Jackie, and I were involved in evaluating this whole process. Uh, and it, it does point to, again, really promising and best practices. A great comment, yeah. Um, the next question that we had on the list was uh, related to the M FM, the section on FMF, uh, and she's asked, you made a comment about FMF for children with diverse families. Uh, the question is, she sort of didn't really write it out in full, but I think she's asking, does, does diverse families include foster families or children in unstable care homes? Um, yeah, certainly within um, foster families, um, unstable care homes, I, I think it would depend on what that instability looked like or what was going on. I'm not, um, I think it depends as well um, on who's uh, administering the FMF if they're um, wanting a certain degree of stability for the child, but certainly uh, children in, in, in a foster care arrangement would potentially be eligible. Um, now, we don't have that yet in Canada. Um, the FMF has been, you know, documented and set up in uh, Washington, but it is a program that we've been working fairly closely with um, Heather to say what would it look like and how can we get some of these things here in Canada. So this is something that we are really motivated towards um, seeing what we can do because it does provide a level of support um, for families that we don't really have necessarily, at least where we are uh, uh, here in Canada. Uh, she actually goes on to ask about, uh, to still regarding the FMF, um, does the FMF address trauma, question mark? She said, associate, or associated and or associated mental health needs. In, our, in their communities, there seems to be a broad movement away from FASD towards mental illness. Some mental health specialists have implied the trauma is the only thing that matters, not the FASD. Hmm. Um, yeah, well, the FMF does address trauma and, and does provide you know, strategies for that because certainly trauma is, is um, a factor for many of our individuals with an FASD. Um, the, the operating principles we come from is that um, really the trauma can sort of be an insult to injury or one of the terms that we've had used before is double jeopardy where you have a brain that is injured by prenatal exposure to alcohol and as has been demonstrated by um, a, a lot of research particularly in, in Dr. Joanne Weinberg's lab that exposure to prenatal alcohol increases the vulnerability of our stress response systems in the brain so that then when you are exposed to a trauma postnatally, you um, are even more vulnerable to that impact. So it becomes a bit of a double jeopardy. So um, sort of a double response here. Number one, yes, FMF does address, you know, trauma and trauma-informed approaches 
to uh, parenting and responding to the needs of kids with an FASD. And secondly, um, I definitely think that mental health responses to individuals with an FASD need to understand that um, the uh, FASD presentation of mental health is unique because we're dealing with um, uh, you know, trauma-induced damage to a brain that was already damaged. And so the way in which they may respond to strategies and supports could be different. So we need to be sensitive to the fact that prenatal alcohol exposure may produce different patterns and response tendencies to that trauma and say attachment issues and all of those related mental health factors. All right, thanks. Um, this next question I think came in during the, uh, the section on the RAP, uh, when you were talking about the RAP program. Uh, she said it would be nice to see statistics, re suspensions and course completion prior to the project. Yeah, and I didn't have those with me today. I'm sorry, uh, but yes, absolutely, and they certainly are higher. And so, and what we have are, and what we're generating for this year, because absolutely we need to put those up, are some um, comparisons across um, other schools and other districts around some of those. So we will be providing those because they are quite different, but we just haven't finished um, compiling that data yet. Mm -hmm. So. Um, one of the challenges, I, Carmen and I often like to present um, as much as we can on work that is really cutting edge. We like to say this is exactly what's going on right now. However, it means that sometimes we have not fully um, compiled all of the data yet because we are in mid-study on most of these studies or we're still in early phases. So even as she indicated with the mile, gave you some data, but there's still a large amount to come in. So. Um, that's why you're only seeing a portion of it. So when that wrap material is, is, is um, published and pulled together, we'll definitely have those comparison rates. And so you're certainly welcome to contact me and as, um, or stay in, in, in touch with me as, as we do that so that you can have access to that information. Uh, and, and another one that came in, I think uh, it came in sort of at the end of the section on RAP uh, and as you were going into the ARC section, uh, so I'm not sure which this is directed at, but I think, she, or she's asking, how do you choose your participants? Um, for, um, that's hard to answer. For RAP, I mean, essentially the school criteria is, is, is that five um, individuals within the school and then to some degree, it's limited by capacity of the program to fund the success coaches, although they do a number of different schools. Um, even expansion of the RAP program, because it has expanded, um, is often reflective of interests in schools really lobbying for, for that. Um, how we choose participants in terms of kids participating or having access to that. I mean, simply having a diagnosis or suspected of having a di you know, a, an FASD their criteria is not really rigid because the success coach is really serving the school much more than the individual, even though they will have a lot of individual contact. It, it is definitely a school support as well and, and, and per, e equipping everybody to respond optimally. Um, so I'm not sure if that was the answer in terms of how it's selected, but um, that's I'm not sure what the, the exact question was, but hopefully that was what she was looking for or he. All right. Um, now moving on to a question about the ARC model. Uh, Georgina is asking, uh, is the ARC model of communication your model or a theoretical model of somebody else's? And she's asking because she wants to be able to cite it. So she's wondering how, how, she, how she should cite it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's our model. Yeah. Uh, and you sort of touched on this uh, with one of the programs earlier, but uh, Marcy's asking which, if any of these programs uh, are offered or accessible to those in the U U.S. You mentioned one that was developed in Washington, but uh, are there any others that you're aware of that are available in the U.S.? Well, certainly the MILE program, as Carmen talked about, is was developed in, in the U.S. and Atlanta. And again, not knowing about its availability. The ALERT program was developed in, that Carmen again talked about, that you can actually just Google ALERT and you'll find it. That was also developed in, what, Chicago, I think? Yeah, it was developed in the U.S. I'm not sure which, which state. But, yeah. And the, the study I referred to, that was a U.S. study um, that, that I reviewed there. And actually, a lot of the interventions on the other intervention slide are U.S.-based interventions. So um, there, is, there are quite a few um, going on in the U.S. 
And I think in the U.S. as well, um, and I, I again, you'd have to email me for sure, but if you're not already in terms of um, material accessible, they do have that no FAS. No, not 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 our KNO, but they have an NO, I think, FAS site. I, I, I get stuff on it, and I just can't remember the website, but it does speak a little bit more to as well what's going on in terms of FASD work in the United States. So the sites that I've provided were a little bit, well, actually, we, we try to put everything in that's, we're, we try to be fairly international in our scope, although obviously we lean a little bit towards Canada, but. Um, there, they do have a few U.S. specific sites that if you're seeking that kind of information or places where you want to connect, feel free to send us a note or me a note anyway. Jackie. Uh, Margo just typed in uh, the website. One website is www.nofas.org, N-O-F-A-S.org. So yeah, that's, that's it. it. That's exactly the one I'm talking about. Thank yeah. you. Is that Margo? Thank you, yeah. Margo. <laughs> um, that's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. Uh, Sherry's actually asking, uh, and Margo says you're welcome, by the way. Um, <laughs> where is that? Sherry uh, is asking about the website for the quarterly newsletter. Is that the Canada FASD um, Research Network website? Yeah, they can go to that website or they can simply email uh, me or the INAT email address that's on the contact page. Um, Sure. Can, you go, can you go back to your slide? I'll flip the screen back over to you, Jackie. If you could just go to that slide with your email addresses, because we, we yeah, referred to just, email yeah. addresses a couple yeah. times, and we'll just get them up on the screen to make sure people have. Yeah, and and they can just. Uh, oh, okay, there we go. And there we go. So um, yeah, if, if you're interested in that e-newsletter, you can just send an email to the INAT at U Alberta site or my own website, JPI. And either is fine, and we will simply add your email address to our mail out list. Often, also, when I add an email address, I'll send out the last um, uh, newsletter that we did. So you have an example of the last one we just put out, which was about a month ago or so. Mm -hmm. um, and Margo's actually put up another uh, website. The CDC uh, has a great site on interventions that they fund in the US, and she's put an address there. It's a bit long to read. Um, That's right. But yeah, uh, but if we could, uh, Margo, if you'd be so kind as to go onto the the Ken where we where this page will be, and you can just go there and search at, at ken.capsi.org. Um, there's an opportunity to comment at the bottom. Any of these websites or resources, feel free to put post those in the comments. So when people go to that page on the site to view this video when it goes up in a few days, uh, they can see all these great uh, resources that you're pointing out here. Um, also. Um, Doug, just to add to that, one of the things that we're also with the um, website here is when you go into the wiki and look at some of the links and resources, we are trying to add to those. So I also encourage folks that if you go into this website and take a look at it, um, there's room and opportunity to provide contact and comments. And so this website is very much a living website in that it's going to be um, developed and added to as people kind of say, hey, make sure you add this link or this is something worth looking at. So, um, Margo, if you're, you know, interested, take a look at it and, and, you know, we're still in development of it and we always will be as we continue to add resources. So we always welcome feedback by anybody to, to add in material here. Uh, so back to the questions. Um, Georgiana is uh, asking, what, is, what, what was your source for the parenting without a parachute? She loved the graphic and would like to use it. Oh, um, I can... I'm going back. Do you mean uh, our pair? Uh, our, our this one, our professionals without parachutes. That the professionals without parachutes, by the way, is the name we use for the arc. I call it the arc because I use it for a number of different people. But when we're working in the schools, um, we call it professionals without parachutes. They they named it. The the educators that came up with that. Um, but this tip sheet I can send out to you, and um, I believe if it's not yet, it will eventually also be in that NoFASD website as a PDF that you could take a look at. But if you send me a note, I can uh, get one to you because this one's a little blurry, I realize, on the uh, uh, PowerPoint. All right. Uh, next question was, uh, are there any plans to implement any of these programs in First Nations communities? Absolutely. That's the short answer. Do you like that? <laughs> All right. 
I, I mean, for sure. And in fact, the um, this one program we're talking about, the ARC program, um, there's a couple of communities in particular in Alberta that I've been chatting with and that we're looking at um, doing this within those communities in the next uh, few months. So it is absolutely something that uh, we're doing. One of the things, because of the way the Professionals Without Parachutes are ARC, um, program that ARC approach is it does allow for a tremendous amount of um, adaptation within communities because really we provide information and then we invite the folks in the community to really think about how that information can be applied and impact their practice and then we work with them on being reflective and, and practicing and trialing those things. And so we've had um, some really lovely conversations within a number of First Nations communities um, who are very excited about this approach to professional learning with this population. All right. We have a comment uh, here from Dan Goldwitz, uh, who's the scientific director at NeuroDevNet. So thanks for joining us, Dan. Um, <laughs> Hi, Dan. <laughs> uh, he's got a question related to Gail's, uh, I believe it was the last comment Gail was making. Uh, and he says, uh, how do we get the funds that are clearly needed? Uh, are there provincial and or federal sources? Are there policy change groups that can help actualize this? Can maybe CAFC even be engaged in this effort? Uh, any thoughts on that, Gail? Or, well, or anyone? Here in Alberta, we have the Alberta Cross Ministries Committee on FASD, uh, which is a group that represents uh, eight different ministries and segments of the government. Uh, but we sit at a common table and there's actually all the uh, members pool funds. So it is a, a, a collaborative government effort. And with this, certainly it's not enough for our wish list, but it's a beginning of people working collaboratively together for a common cause. So I would encourage other provincial jurisdictions to, to look at developing that at, the, at their government level, where we have an, an opportunity to actually influence policy and to direct the funds into some specific areas. For example, the RAP project that's at the, at the Cross Ministries table, this whole network across the province of the different program networks that was developed at this particular table. Uh, so I, I would encourage the individual provincial governments to you know, try to replicate this and I'm not sure what TAFC's position is, uh, or federally, uh, I know the Public Health Agency of Canada has a representative on our Alberta Cross Ministries Committee. So certainly, uh, PHAC is aware of what we're doing and also contributes comments. But yeah, well, certainly. Whether the, the, that's uh, some sort of spur the rest of the country to, to, to try to do the same thing. Yeah. Well, certainly the Public Health Agency of Canada has been has been supporting and, and funding a lot of CAFC's work as well in, in the area of the screening tools. And, and of course, CAFC is always interested in this topic. This is something that affects all of our members, the children's hospitals, rehab centers, and other children's health centers across the country. Um, so we're always interested in uh, doing what we can to contribute to this. And some of our learnings from our work in FASD is actually benefiting other childhood disability groups. Uh, with you know some similar systems of care and sharing what works in one uh, particular group with another, you know we do a lot of cross fertilization with autism. Yeah, uh, we have one more question, but before we get to that, uh, Maureen's asking if we can see those emails one more time, uh, Jackie, just so they can get those, make sure they have those written down. You uh, gotcha. Uh, the last question is related to the Caribbean Quest. Um, she said. She said, is that available to those in the U.S. again? Uh, could someone come to could someone come to Canada and be trained to implement slash coach it on an individual basis? And if not, uh, what is a comparable option that is available now in the market? Um, I don't know about comparable, but um, uh, at this point, we like I said, we're working on sort of these training and it's not available in the U.S. at, at this point in time. Uh, but um, the training uh, module and the approach that we put together is all on a, a Moodle. So we've tried to put it all into an online format to increase accessibility to training. And similarly, the program itself is, is available through online. So we're actually able to, to stream it to, to people. 
Now, in terms of how that's going to boil out and become accessible to folks, that the program itself is, is belongs to Dr. Kim Kearns. And so that's something that we're going to be in conversation to decide how that all happens. Um, but nothing in the short term, unfortunately. Um, I don't know, uh, and I'm looking at Carmen as I'm talking, but otherwise, I mean, there are definitely other programs out there that, you know, that, that advocate for these kinds of things. Um, that none of which, I, I, I mean, I think CogMed does some stuff, they're expensive. Um, they haven't done a lot with the FASD group that I'm aware of, although there could be stuff that's new. Um, but none that provide the level of training on the metacognitive strategies that we do and that we feel quite strongly about. So we're very um, um, passionate, I guess, about the idea that it's not just about putting kids in front of video games, it's about coaching them as they play these games. And that training is, and that's why we create that training in Moodle. So bottom line, we don't have anything available right now. We hope to at some point, if we ever do get to the point where it's available, it should be available from anywhere both the training and the program. But I have no answers on exactly what that will look like yet. All right. Well, that's the uh, end of the questions. Uh, and again, we keep trying to squeeze these webinars into an hour, but uh, with the, the interest and the discussion and the... Uh, it, we just can't seem to do that. So uh, we've, we've managed to stretch it into another hour and a half session, but we still have the vast majority of the audience is still out there listening, which, uh, you know, again, just shows us how interested people are. So uh, I think we'll just try and wrap it up now. Is, is there any final comments, closing comments from, from any of our, uh, our panel or, get, or from Gail? Uh, it's Gail here. Uh, it, we could actually continue this conversation with any people on the call who are going to be going to the fifth international conference on FASD in uh, Vancouver next month, February 27th to March the 2nd. Uh, the whole the title is Research Re Results and Relevance, Integrating Research Policy and Prom Promising Practices Around the World. And our, our team is doing a presentation on uh, preschool diagnoses, and there'll be a lot of opportunities for discussion and meeting the other researchers and clinicians, and there's always a strong caregiver component to these conferences. <clears throat> All right. And Jackie, Carmen, any final thoughts? I have no final thoughts. Just thank everybody thank for their interest. All right. All right. Well, and thank you to, to again to the panelists. It, it has been great, as as we can always tell by the number of questions that we had. Uh, I'd just like to direct everyone's attention to the next uh, webinar in the series. I've got up on the screen uh, is is bringing our 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 partners, our colleagues from NeuroDevNet to talk about the full breadth of the research that they're taught that that they are doing in the area of FASD. Um, you know, as as I've written there, many are familiar with. If you've heard of NeuroDevNet, you often associate them with their work in in the genetics and the uh, cellular biology and a lot of that. Re research that they're doing, but it goes far beyond that. They have a broad range of research projects that are going on, all related to FASD. And we're going to have James Reynolds uh, from Queen's University, who's the NeuroDevNet's lead in the uh, FASD component. He's going to be coming with a number of his other colleagues from NeuroDevNet to talk about the full breadth of what, what NeuroDevNet is currently doing uh, related to FASD. So that's going to be on February 13th. And we now have all of CAFC's webinars are... Uh, uh, are happening on Wednesdays at 11 o'clock uh, Eastern Time. Uh, if you go to CAFC.org's website, uh, this is our webinar program is called CAFC Presents. We have a calendar there that's showing you what uh, what's coming up for the uh, uh, week to week. Uh, next week, we have uh, a presentation from our colleagues at McMaster Children's Hospital talking about their use of lean uh, protocols in developing a new children's uh, uh, medical center. Uh, and then following that, we have a number of other FASD, back to our FASD screening uh, tools webinar series as well. So again, go check out CAFC.org uh, and the CAFC Presents section. Be sure to check out the Knowledge Exchange Network uh, and hopefully Margot and any of the others who are listening uh, will be able to enter any comments and provide resources, links and everything else. We will have the recording up in a, it usually takes four or five days for me to get the recording up there. And as well, we'll try to get the PDF of the PowerPoint slides and, and any other resources that uh, Jackie or Carmen or Gail are, are able to send us. And uh, that being said, I think we'll close this off and thanks again. And hopefully we'll see everyone uh, at uh, our upcoming webinars. So bye everyone. Thank you.
The organizer has ended the session.